Whenever I fill one of these out, I worry that I'm not doing it right. Am I giving them the correct information? Is my description of the accident detailed enough to be useful? Can we really make good safety decisions based upon these reports? How can I be sure I'm doing the right thing for the company and our employees? Employers and managers like you have a powerful tool for making their facilities safer. It's OSHA's record-keeping system, often referred to as Part 1904 after its federal regulation part number. The information, forms, and procedures required by Part 1904 actually make it easier for you to document workplace injuries and illnesses identify how they happen, and make good decisions for the long-term improvement of workplace safety. But Part 1904 does even more. It gets employees involved in the record-keeping process and protects their right to a safe workplace. You play an important role in making this all happen. In this program, we will explore how your contribution helps improve workplace safety for everyone. Why is record keeping so important? How can a few more records or some accident statistics actually make your facility a safer place to work? What part do you play in the process? By gathering and organizing more information on work-related injuries and illnesses, you can help determine whether they form patterns this enables you to identify problems and then take steps to eliminate them. Workplace injury and illness records can also help your employees to focus on the specific hazards that they may encounter in your facilities. Once they have this information, they'll be more likely to follow proper procedures and report dangerous conditions. And that's an attitude that makes workplaces safer for everyone. Comprehensive record keeping has another advantage too. The data that you collect helps OSHA get a sense of the hazards that are common to many work environments. So the agency can help employers and employees avoid them. By keeping good injury and illness records, you participate in protecting millions of workers across the country, not just those in your own facility. But there are some misconceptions about record keeping that you should be aware of. For example, recording a work-related injury or illness does not necessarily mean that an OSHA rule was violated. Also, these records are not meant to point a finger at any particular person or to determine who is eligible for workers' compensation or other benefits. These records exist for one reason only to make all companies safer. Regardless of what industry you're in, it's your responsibility to know which, if any, OSHA record keeping requirements apply to you. Whether you have to keep injury and illness records, and if so, what kind, can depend on a number of things. For example, if your organization had 10 or fewer employees during all of the last calendar year, it could be considered partially exempt. If your business falls into one of OSHA's specific low hazard classifications, such as the retail, service, finance, insurance, or real estate industries, it may also be partially exempt from record keeping. What does partially exempt mean? It means your organization is not required to keep injury and illness records for OSHA unless you are asked in writing to do so by OSHA by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, or by a state agency operating under the authority of OSHA or the BLS. OSHA categorizes businesses based on the North American Industrial Classification System, 
NAICS for short, which is used by federal agencies to organize information about the U.S. economy. Industries that are partially exempt from OSHA record-keeping requirements are listed by NAICS code in an appendix to Part 1904. Examples of such businesses and their NAICS codes include 722110 Full Service Restaurants, 524210 Insurance Agencies, 448210 Shoe Stores, 441110 New Car Dealers, 812811 Barber Shops. 713950 bowling centers, and there are many more. OSHA's website at www.osha.gov provides description information for all NAICS codes, so you can determine if your organization is partially exempt from record keeping. You can also get information on NAICS codes and record-keeping exemptions by contacting your nearest regional OSHA office. If your company is not exempt from OSHA's requirements, you must record all work-related employee injuries and illnesses. Maintain these records and make them available to OSHA and your company's employees. But how do you know if an injury is recordable under Part 1904? First of all, you don't have to worry about recording minor medical problems. If a cut requires only an adhesive bandage, or a burn doesn't blister and needs just a bit of first aid cream, then they aren't recordable injuries. But if someone loses work days or is restricted from doing certain tasks, or if a worker requires special medical treatment or hospitalization, their injuries or illnesses may well be recordable. This is true no matter what position the person has with the company, regardless of whether they are classified as labor or executive, hourly or salaried, part-time, seasonal or migrant. They have equal protection under Part 1904. Recordable injuries and illnesses must also be documented for employees who are not on your payroll if you supervise these employees on a day-to-day -day basis, such as some contractors. Once you've determined that an injury or illness is serious and that the affected worker is covered by the record-keeping guidelines, you must make sure that the problem is work-related and a new case. Let's look more closely at what these criteria mean. The definition of work-related covers so much ground that it's easier to explain when a condition is not work-related. Obviously, a medical problem is not work-related if it results from events that take place outside of work. But a health issue is also not work-related if it occurs in the workplace during off hours or is unrelated to the injured employee's job. For example, let's say that a woodworker in a small furniture making company is building a chair for use in his own home. One evening outside of normal business hours, he is working on this personal project when he accidentally hurts his hand using a lathe. Because this injury didn't occur during the employee's normal workday, and has nothing to do with his job, this is not considered a work-related injury under Part 1904. If an injury or illness is due to voluntary participation in a recreational activity, such as playing softball on the company team, it is also not considered to be work-related. Medical conditions that result from eating or drinking in the workplace are not considered to be work-related either. Health problems due to personal grooming, self-medication for a non-work-related condition, or intentionally self-inflicted injuries are also not included. Neither are injuries caused by motor vehicle accidents on company parking lots while an employee is commuting to or from work. Common cold or flu infections aren't considered work-related 
but contagious diseases such as tuberculosis or hepatitis A can be considered work-related if the employee is infected while performing their job. As you can see, determining whether or not a condition is work-related can be complicated. Figuring out whether it's new or not can be tricky too. An injury or illness is considered new if the employee hasn't had an injury or illness like it before, or the employee did have a health problem like it before and recovered from it, only to have something in the workplace cause it to reappear. Sometimes finding these things out can require a bit of detective work on your part. For each case, you'll want to talk to the sick or injured employee to get the basic facts, your company's designated physician for an expert medical opinion, and co-workers who may have seen something that others missed. It's crucial for the information to be accurate when you are investigating an illness or injury. So stick to the facts and be careful of people who appear to be speculating about an incident, even if they're trying to be helpful. Be sure you don't do any speculating yourself as well. Once you've established that an injury or illness is both work-related and new, it's time to fill out Form 300, the Log of Work-Related Injuries and Illnesses. This is the ongoing record of the illnesses and injuries that occur in a facility. The form asks for information like who was injured or became sick, when did this happen? What was this person doing at the time? Was the activity a part of the victim's job? Was anyone else present at the time of the incident? Were any other workers harmed? What medical treatment did the victim receive? Be sure to note the estimated number of days that any injured or sick employee will be on medical leave or restricted from performing their normal work. Next comes Form 301, the Injury and Illness Incident Report. It asks you for more details about each incident. 301 forms must be filled out within seven days after the incident has occurred. You don't need to complete Form 300A, the Summary of Work-Related Injuries and Illnesses, until near the end of the calendar year. Form 300A helps you create an overview of employee injury patterns over the preceding year. That way you can make better informed decisions on how to improve worker safety at your facility. Form 300A divides all recordable medical problems into five categories. Injuries, skin disorders, respiratory conditions, poisonings, and a miscellaneous category called all other illnesses. You assign each recordable incident to the category that describes it best, then add up the totals for each category. All three of the OSHA record-keeping forms are written in plain language and use a convenient question and answer format that makes information gathering easier. And they include flow charts and checklists that you'll find helpful as well. Information about workplace illnesses and injuries must be made available to employees. That's why Part 1904 requires you to post the Form 300A summary from February 1 to April 30 of the following year in a conspicuous place where notices to employees are normally displayed. The form must be visible at all times, never altered, defaced, or even covered by other material. If they want more detailed information, employees must also be given access to injury and illness records, but not materials that are considered confidential. Remember though, reading reports isn't the only or even the most important way that employees get involved in the record keeping process. Employees are your eyes and ears as far as injury and illness situations are concerned so you need to be sure that they know how to report these incidents when they occur. To encourage employee participation in the record-keeping process, Part 1904 prevents companies from discriminating against anyone who reports a work-related fatality, injury, or illness. 
The standard also protects workers who file safety and health complaints, ask for access to Part 1904 records, or exercise any rights afforded by OSHA. As with any other system, OSHA record keeping has its share of special situations you may have to deal with. For example, OSHA wants to find out about some types of injuries and incidents almost as soon as they happen, so they can identify and reduce hazards in the workplace more effectively. That's why Part 1904 requires you to report any work-related fatalities to OSHA within eight hours of the event. You must also report all work-related inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, and losses of an eye within 24 hours of the event. These reports can be made by telephone or in person to your local OSHA office or you can call OSHA's central phone number. If your company already complies with another government agency's injury and illness record keeping requirements, OSHA will accept those records in place of its 300 series reports as long as they officially recognize the other agency's records and the other agency's records contain all of the information that OSHA requires. OSHA is also flexible regarding the 300 series forms themselves. If official 300, 301, and 300A forms are unavailable, equivalent forms may be used. Equivalent forms must contain the same information as an official form, be as readable and understandable as an official OSHA form, and be completed by following the same instructions as those that are used with the OSHA forms. Keeping records organized and available is also important to OSHA. Once 300, 301, and 300A forms are completed, they must be retained for five years following the end of the calendar year that they cover. During this storage period, OSHA 300 forms must be updated to include new information about the ailments they record, such as recurring illnesses or other medical conditions. If the description or outcome of a case changes, the original entry must be removed and the new information entered. But keep in mind that these rules apply to OSHA 300 forms only. OSHA 301 and 300A forms do not have to be updated. OSHA also wants to make sure that it has access to all of the information your company has recorded. When an authorized government representative asks for the records kept under Part 1904, your company must provide copies within four business hours. And if you receive OSHA's Annual Audit and Verification Program Survey form, you must fill it out and return it in a timely fashion. Your response must include the number of people employed at your facility in the specified year, the number of hours worked by these employees, and any information that OSHA requests from records that you have kept under Part 1904. Finally, some states operate their own OSHA programs under the authority of a state plan approved by OSHA. Records for these state programs are acceptable to OSHA as long as the states have occupational injury and illness reporting requirements that are identical to the requirements of Part 1904. We've seen that every stage of OSHA's record-keeping process leads toward a single goal, greater safety on the job for everyone. Let's review. OSHA record-keeping not only enables you to make your own facility a safer place to work, it also helps make employees safer at other companies across the country. You can check whether your company is partially exempt from OSHA record-keeping by looking up your NAICS code on the OSHA website. Recordable illnesses and injuries are generally severe enough to require medical treatment or hospitalization 
and to affect the employee's ability to do their job. Recordable incidents must also be work-related and new. Form 300, the Log of Work-Related Injuries, and Form 301, the Injury and Illness Incident Report, are both critical forms in the record-keeping process. Form 300A, the year-end summary of work-related injuries and illnesses, must be posted for employees to see from February 1 to April 30 of the following year. Part 1904 also protects employees' rights to report incidents of work-related illnesses and injuries and ensures that all employees are treated equally. And remember, you must inform OSHA of work-related fatalities within eight hours and inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, and losses of an eye within 24 hours. Your OSHA record-keeping duties under Part 1904 aren't just make work and pushing paper. They are the core of how companies can learn from their experiences today and become even safer places to work tomorrow.